So now, uh, Julian uh, Colm from University of Vienna is going to present financing and resolving uh, banking groups, and we are going to give him this. So thank you, and let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present. This is joint work with Alba Pagnale Estagnol from Pompeo Fabra and John Laurent, who is also in the audience. Nevertheless, all errors are mine. So the financial crisis of 07, 08 has demonstrated the cost of the failure of large and complex banks. And in response, we've seen a bunch of regulatory reforms that, among other things, aimed at reducing the probability and public costs of bank failures. And so these regulations include improvements of what's called resolution mechanisms and uh, in order to make large and complex banks more resolvable, they require banks to prepare resolution plans, sometimes called living wills, that need to be accepted slash negotiated with the supervisor. Um, banks are also required to hold TLAC that includes financial claims that can be written down or diluted during resolution in order to um, recapitalize these institutions. So within this broad framework of making banks more resolvable, there are two big approaches. One is called single point of entry, where resolution by and large attempts to preserve a banking group's corporate structure. It mutualizes losses within the banking group. And this is chosen by many of the large banks and arguably preferred by regulators, although to varying degrees. And then there is what's called multiple point of entry, where different parts of a group may be resolved separately, thus changing the corporate structure of a banking group upon resolution. To do this, banks have to specify so-called entry points at which the regulator can take control. Um, this resolution approach maintains the limited liability between different parts of a banking group that are resolved separately, and this has been chosen, for instance, by BBUVA, HSBC, and Santander. So the key questions we want to address in this paper is what is the trade-off that's implied by this choice between single point and multiple point of entry resolution regimes? How do these different resolution regimes affect the ability to operate banking groups and units? How this affects the continuation of banking units following negative shocks? And if from a policy and empirical implications perspective, we're interested in for which banking groups makes single point of entry or multiple point of entry more sense? And is regulators' preference for SPV justified or not. So let me jump straight into the model. So we're going to have banking groups with two uh, potentially asymmetric units. We call them H and L. So there will be a holding company that owns those two units that make the loans. Uh, and these will be wholly owned uh, subsidiaries. So these banking groups will be run by wealthless bankers. They're centralized uh, decision making uh, at the holding level, and the groups are subject to resolution regimes. So in terms of uh, investment, uh, for those who know, this is a simplified Holmstrom and Tyrol model uh, with uh, two units. So there will be an organizational structure and resolution regime is given. Then at t equals zero banks, raise one unit of investment, one unit of funds per unit they operate. At day t equal one, there uh, might be a negative shock that realizes with probability Q, and with some probability QH, it hits the H unit, with some probability L, the L unit. And if a unit experiences such a shock, it requires another unit of reinvestment. If reinvestment does not occur, it will never generate a return. Then after the realization of any possible shock and any potential reinvestment, bankers make monitoring decisions for each of those units that increase um, 
the, uh, the probability that the bank generates a return, and then there's a simple binary return structure where with some probability there is a success payoff R um, and otherwise zero. And both the success payoffs, the probability of success and the probability of, um, of a shock can be different between those two units. And we assume a standard that both investment and reinvestment here are positive MPV with monitoring and negative MPV without. So in terms of financing information, so bankers have no wealth and raise financing from competitive credit markets. All parties are risk, neutral, protected, limited liability, and this confect of one, very standard. Returns are observable, monitoring decisions are not, also very standard. Then less standard, um, the shock here at T equal one will be the private information of bankers. And the inability of markets to observe these shocks obviously prevents financing contracts that are contingent on the realization of these shocks. And this will reduce the ability to raise financing for reinvestment outside of resolution. And there's an extension in the paper that goes into detail with this, but um, we are not going to discuss this further. But just remind, you know, without resolution, there will be less ability to raise funding for this. Now, what does resolution do? Well, resolution is used if the bankers report that the unit has suffered a shock. And if resolution and its use, a regulator temporarily takes over control of the bank. He then verifies the shock. So resolution here serves as a state verification device of whether shock has indeed occurred or not. And this will uh, facilitate refinancing because, well, the regulator uh, knows whether shock has occurred and can act accordingly. The regulator can then restructure existing claims and raise new financing, and his goal will be to maximize ex post efficiency, so that is efficiency wants resolution serves. To do so, he will ensure monitoring and maximize continuation and reinvestment of units and minimize losses to existing investors. And we make one assumption here, which is that in the absence of resolution, banks cannot raise sufficient financing to reinvest units that suffer negative shocks. So resolution here is really necessary to ensure that refinancing might occur. In terms of the different resolution regimes, SPU resolution we model this as resolution that always ensues at the holding company. The units are resolved jointly and the losses are mutualized. With MPU resolution, the, it, there's the possibility to designate one or both units as entry points that are resolved separately when they're hit by a shock. There are no transfers between units that are resolved separately. And if a unit is hit by a shock that's not an entry point, then resolution shows that the holding and both units are resolved jointly. So as a benchmark to understand what resolution regimes do, let's have a look at what would an optimal contract be in this environment. So the first thing we want to look at is the pledgeable income at t equal one that is after a shock and after any potential reinvestment. And very standard due to the agency costs of uh, monitoring, the pledgeable income will be lower than the present value of these units. And we can decompose the pledgeable income of a two-unit banking group into the pledgeable income of the two units, plus a synergy term that comes from cross-pledging um, returns uh, from the banker side. So, and this is all um, kind of standard. And then we may just simply, you know, to, to give meaning to our H and L units, we assume that an H unit has a higher pledgeable income at T equal one. Now, the interesting thing happens when we look at the pledgeable income of T equal zero, which depends on the reinvestment decision row, which might be that you either continue, never reinvest into any unit, reinvest only into the H or only into the L unit if it receives a shock and not if the other unit is shocks. And of course, you may also reinvest into both units if they receive a shock. And depending on your reinvestment choice, you either have to absorb the cost of reinvestment with in expectations QI for each of those units, or if the unit gets a shock, you um, only have the pledgeable income 
of the remaining unit and you lose the pleasurable income of the other unit and the synergies. Now the key question here is which operation reinvestments decisions can the bank finance? So to look at this, let's first think about when does the pledgeable income of a banking group at t equals zero increase in the reinvestment decision. And the condition that governs this is very simple. So reinvesting into a unit increases the amount of financing that can be pledged at t equals zero if the marginal contribution of that unit that is its standalone pledgeable income P1i plus the synergies that come from operating both units together is larger than the reinvestment cost of one. And if that's the case, then reinvesting into this unit increases the pledgeable income at the equal zero irrespective of whether there's reinvestment into the other unit or not. Now, if a bank can operate both units in the first place so that it can raise two units of capital at t equals zero, this implies it's always optimal to reinvest into the H unit. The reason being that when, when the pledgeable income at t equals zero that has to account for the cost of future reinvestment is larger than two, then the marginal contribution of at least one of the two units must be uh, larger than half that, which is uh, then larger than one, and since the H unit has the larger contribution, it, is, it always increases the pledgeable income, and since investment is efficient, it is always efficient to invest into this. This brings us to the L unit, where that's not necessarily true, and in particular, there's the, for us, uh, important and interesting case where the pledgeable income of the L unit is so low that its reinvestment lowers the pledgeable income at t equals zero and it requires transfers from the other unit in order to reinvest. And now if you know this expected financing deficit of continuing reinvesting into the L unit is large enough, this might cause the t equals zero pledgeable income to fall short of the required investment of uh, two at t equals zero, in which case the bank cannot finance both units, even though that would be value maximizing. So we are left with three different cases. So it is optimal to operate both units and reinvest in both units if the pledgeable income uh, is sufficient for doing so. If not, then it might be optimal to operate both units, but reinvest, uh, reinvest, sorry, there's a typo, so reinvest only in the H unit following a shock, because reinvestment in the L unit is too costly if you can only finance the initial investment if you do not reinvest into the L unit. And of course, there's the case where you just don't have enough pledgeable income to reinvest into both units in any case, and we rule this out uh, since we're interested in, well, the resolution of banking groups, so banking groups need to be able to form in the first place. So what does this tell us about resolution? Well, SPU resolution preserves corporate structure and mutualizes losses. So a regulator that steps in and takes control of the bank can and will transfer resources within this banking group to reinvest in any unit. And that's always possible because if the bank can raise two units of investment in the first place, then it can always raise another unit after writing down existing claims if reinvestment is required. And since um, the regulator maximizes net present value, he will do that. As a result, the pledgeable income of an SPUE bank will be equal to the, to the maximum pledgeable income that can be achieved if you continue both units. And so this will implement the constraint optimum if indeed it is constraint optimal to continue both units. Now, for MPU resolution, uh, let's consider the case when you know, a unit is an entry point in that case, the unit is resolved separately if it suffers a shock, 
and because the regulator then cannot transfer resources to that unit from the remainder of the banking group, there will be no reinvestment if the standalone pledgeable income of that unit is smaller than the required reinvestment of one. Now, we already know that it's never optimal not to reinvest into the H unit, so it will never be optimal to specify the H unit as an entry point because there's no reason not to reinvest, so in that case there's no benefit from splitting the banking group. For the L unit now, designating as an entry point is optimal exactly when no reinvestment into the L unit is constrained optimal ex ante because it forces the regulator not to reinvest into the L unit because the L unit cannot receive transfers given the structure of the resolution the regime. Now um, this allocation of entry points implements the constraint optimum exactly in the second case of our proposition when it is possible to operate both units in the first place if and only if the, you shut down the L unit in case it gets a shock. Now in terms of efficiency, uh, what we can say is that one of the two resolution regimes can implement the constraint optimal operation reinvestment decisions. Importantly, the coexistence of both resolution regimes with a bank specific application is much more efficient than would be either resolution regime alone uniformly applied across banks because very naturally, you know, these pledgeable incomes will obviously be banking group specific, so the optimal continuation policies will be banking group specific and choosing a targeted resolution approach will be valuable. So, you know, to summarize, pure resolution can lead to the shutdown of units that's inefficient ex post, but constrained optimal and necessary ex ante to form the group in the first place. And this will be particularly important, you know, if units are sufficiently asymmetric such that there are some weak units, and this might be because units have different scopes, competencies, geographical footprints, and so on. SPU resolution, on the other hand, is constrained optimal when financing capacities are sufficiently high to ensure reinvestment into all these units, and also when units are symmetric, in which case transfers between those units will be low generally. And However, you know, if SPU resolution does not implement the constraint optimum, it can prevent ex ante investment and hinder efficient investment and group formation. So what do we learn from this? Well, MPUE banks can shut down weak units following uh, shock uh, to investors, so they should only designate weak units as entry point. There will be set risk parties more likely to finance riskier investments because they can insulate themselves from the transfers of necessary for reinvestment if risks in those units materialize. And they might also be less likely to curtail investment in weak units during crisis for the same reason. Now importantly, MPU resolution requires a commitment not to reinvest into the L unit after shock, even if continuation is ex post efficient. And this commitment might be easier to achieve in a cross-border context where, where you know, there are different regulators that might find it easier to ensure that they do not transfer rules across borders. So we can in general say a bit more about cross-border banks. So one reason why we observe MPOE in a cross-border context might be because these banks simply have more heterogeneous units, which makes MPOE the optimal choice for them. There's also a reverse causality here that um, MPOE banks are more likely to engage in cross-border activities because they can insulate themselves from the risks. And this might even be a strategic choice to make MPOE resolution credible when regulators face commitment problems that might make MPU non credible. So, in the interest of time, let me skip the comparison with the literature. So, what we show is that the choice of a resolution regime affects banking groups' financing and investment decisions. SPU resolution mutualizes losses and allows for ex post efficient continuation of weak units after negative shocks, but can prevent ex ante efficient investment. 
and PUEU resolution when it's separate resource banking units can prevent exposed efficient investment but might be necessary to finance operation of weak units which is ex ante efficient in the first place. Now in terms of you know, unmodeled effects and possible avenues forward, one might think about regulatory biases towards inefficient continuation and if that's the case, obviously things might be a bit different. And you know, in a richer model, one might think about the choice of a resolution regime also affecting the probability of entering resolution, but that's you know, outside of the current model. Thank you. Thank you. So Alonso Villacorta from UC Santa Cruz is going to discuss just one second so that I can put the presentation. Here you go. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'm very happy to be discussing this paper here about the resolution of banking groups. And as Julian already described, I mean, the bank resolution implies this restructuring of liabilities that helps limiting the disruptions of, on bank operations. And it involves a dilution of creditors, not typically equity and holders of uh, long-term debt. Now, when we think about the resolution of banking groups, we can think about these different regimes. The SPOE regime, in which the resolution takes at the banking group as a whole, or the MPOE regime, in which we just can resolve it at the subsidiary level. Then the paper, that the, the question that this paper asks is, what is the optimal resolution strategy for a bank, banking group? Should creditor from one subsidiary be diluted in order to compensate the losses from an, another subsidiary? And to answer this question, this paper provides a theoretical framework that emphasizes a trade-off. In particular, the SPOE resolution, which is basically the commitment from the bank holding company to bail in any subsidiary, is optimal exposed, but it's gonna hurt investors. And that can deter investment ex ante. Then the main result in the paper is that under certain conditions, an MPOE resolution can be better than the SPOE resolution. And therefore, the resolution regime should be bank specific. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you first a very simplified version of the model. Just going to keep the key ingredient that leads to, to the key results, and then I'm just going to make two, two comments. So let's imagine that we have two banks, so two units. Each bank has access to a project which value VH and VL. So this represents the present discounted value of the payoffs of the project. Now, financing each project costs one, and we're going to assume that these Vs are higher than one. With some probability in the future, these projects are going to require some additional financing. But even these Vs, VH and VL, are high enough. So even taking into account the expected cost, we would like to take these projects. What is the friction? There is a funding friction. Enough payoff must be from, the, from this project must be used to compensate insiders due to an agency friction. Then part of the value, EH and EL, that goes to the bankers. And only the part PH and PL, those are the pledgeable value that we can use to give it outsiders, which are the ones that are going to be providing the financing. So very easy we can see here if the, to finance a project as a standalone bank requires that this PH or PL are higher than one. Otherwise, we cannot raise the, the funding. The interesting case in the paper comes when this PL is lower than one. So there is one unit that cannot fund itself. However, if we form a banking group, we can use the whole pledgeable value, PH plus PL, to raise the two units of funding, if PH plus PL is higher than two. And this is optimal, and this is what bankers are going to do. In addition, in the paper, forming a banking group generates kind of additional value, PS, but I'm going to assume that this is zero, because it's not needed. Now, exposed, in the future, there can be a liquidity shock. So with probability QL, the L unit may require additional financing, one unit cost of funding, or the project is lost. So how can we raise this unit of funding exposed? Well, we need to promise part of the pledgeable value to the new investors. So it requires a transfer from the initial creditors to the new creditors, that we typically call a bail-in. So if initial creditors take this into account ex ante at time zero, then what would happen if there is a shock and there is no reinvestment? So we're going to lose the L unit. So then there's this P0 value that we can promise to initial investors. Now with probability QL, we're going to lose the L project. So we have QL times zero. Now, if there is reinvestment, 
and we can commit to the bail-in, these investors are going to lose even more. Because now they are going to lose, we need to raise one unit of funding, so one minus PL, remember PL is lower than one, is going to be used from the H unit to compensate for the losses in the L unit. Then commitment to reinvestment or to a bail-in is actually bad for the initial creditors, and that, that leads to a trade-off. So exposed, we always want to reinvest in the, v, in the L unit. Remember, these V values are very high. But that's bad for initial creditors. So if the ex ante, if the expected value in dilution is large, the initial creditors may prefer not to finance the, the bank holding company. So there are two cases. If the expected bail in dilution for the creditors is small, then good. We can finance at T0 and commit to the reinvestment at T1. That's optimal. But case two, if expected bail in is too large, then investors would prefer not to give financing, then it would be ex-ante optimal if we can commit to not reinvest into the old units. So here we have resolution comes. So in the paper, their model resolution as the bankers can declare the shock. In that case, the regulator takes control and it's gonna re reorganize the bank, diluting claims as needed, with the objective to maximize the net present value. So because this project have positive net present value, the regulator will try to continue the project if it can. So with the SPOE regime, then the regulator can use all of the claims and is going to be willing to do it. So it's actually a commitment to reinvest and bail in and continue the project. The MPOE regime instead, the regulator can only use the L unit claims, which so he can only dilute the PL part which is lower than one. So it's basically a commitment to not reinvest into the L unit. Then in case one, we have that the SPOE is optimal, while in the case two, in which we would prefer to commit to not reinvest, the MPOE is optimal. So that's a kind of, the, to my reading, the, the key message of the paper, uh, which I mean provides an interesting and clear message. An SPOE resolution, which is a commitment to bail-in, can be optimal exposed, but can deter investment ex ante so the resolution re regime should be bank specific. The paper also includes a, a nice complementarities of agency friction that the banking group can, can, can uh, enhance. It's interesting, but I don't think it's needed for the, for the main results. So now just let me do two comments. So first, a comment is, is this about SPOE versus MPOE or actually resolution versus liquidation? So in the model, MPOE is optimal when the expected bail-in dilution cost for the initial investor is large. So in that case, it would be optimal to use the MPOE regime such that in case there is a shock, the L unit is liquidated. But then here I was wondering, isn't the main purpose of the resolution to limit the liquidation instead? So the paper message is under some circumstances, MPOE is better than SPOE, but it looks that the message is under some circumstances, liquidation is actually better than continuation or than resolution, right? Which is also, I mean, an, an interesting message. And when resolution is actually better than liquidation, or continuation is better than liquidation, actually SPOE is better or, or equal than, than MPOE. If that's the case, I, I thought it may be useful to relate the paper to uh, Bolton and Sharpstein, 90 or 96, in which, I mean, we have these models that show that limit to renegotiation or commitment to terminate funding helps mitigating incentive problems, so it's efficient and ex ante. And then a second comment here was thinking how to interpret the, the bankers and how to interpret the resolution. So in the model, bankers are motivated as these insiders that require skin in the game. We're thinking of them as managers or inside equity, but they are not diluted after resolution because we're required to maintain the project value. They are the ones monitoring. So in the end, bankers obtain all of the benefits from the resolution and the bail-in. So it looks then that the main purpose of the resolution or the regulator is to protect bankers' insiders' value at the expense of these other creditors. Right? So in, pra in practice, I, mean, I think that dilution order starts with the managers and equity holders. So I was thinking, is this actually the right framework to think about resolution? But I, mean, I can see an alternative interpretation in which we think that these claims that we want to conserve that are promised to bankers could be claims just that goes to depositors. And in that case, I would see the main purpose of the, of the resolution to, to limit depositor losses and to, the, to limit then a, a bank run. Right? So I'm not sure if this alternative interpretation would, would work. Um, I, I have time? Have a minute? No? Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. So very interesting paper on a very important topic and 
it shows that it is crucial to think about the exact incentive when, when we're designing the resolution framework. Thank you. And Julian, do you want to reply? Yeah, thank you for the very thoughtful discussion. So you're right that these incentive synergies are not necessary for the results of the model. They just happen to occur and then that's why we treat them. Um, and you're also right that MPU resolution here is only valuable if it leads to some liquidation. I think the important thing here is that it's only partial liquidation. So the, the multiple point of entry allows you to liquidate a part of the banking group while others continue their operations. And I think that's, uh, that's the point we want to make there. And then about bankers and their dilution. So bankers in the model can be diluted if the funding constraint is not exactly binding. So there is some dilution of banks. You're right to the extent that you know their claims are protected. And, and my personal favorite interpretation of this is, you know, these are the types of funds that banks need to, to continue their operations, you know? I mean, somebody has to monitor these loans, run all these operations, and you cannot uh, dilute away the claims of, uh, of the people who are supposed to, to fulfill these functions. Right. Thank you. So questions, comments on the paper? Ah, uh, yes, okay, so. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I had a question um, related to the possibility that there is also um, a bailout decision by the authorities, either because there are limits to commitment or because the, the framework allows for some probability of it. Um, so, might this still the, the, the incentives of the banks, uh, well, or, or their, their, their preference uh, towards uh, multiple points of entry to, to try to, to maximize the, the bailout contributions that they can have. I mean, do you see that it's feasible to, to, to do extensions to consider this? Uh, it's, a, it's a broad question. I, I know that it can uh, affect the, the structure of the model, but yes, this, this broad question. Thank you. There's another one there in the back. Yes. Thank you. Uh, from my side, just a practical suggestion. I think the model should be refined and can be refined to better reflect the spirit of the resolution framework. So on one hand, the choice between SPE and MPE um, has to do more with, the, with practical aspects, such as the separability of the subsidiary from the parent or the decentralization of the operations at the subsidiary level. And secondly, uh, when we talk about the choice whether to recapitalize an SP subsidiary or not, uh, this is the result and it, it's the, actually it's something that is dictated by the so-called public interest test. So you check whether it is in the public interest or not to resolve that subsidiary that is in failing status through resolution or liquidation. Um, so the choice uh, has nothing to do with future profitability of the subsidiary. But these are practical considerations that I think could be used to enrich the model. Thank you. Thank you. And there was one question here. Angel? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just to know your uh, uh, thoughts with respect, for example, to in the case of the single point of entry, if they are operating the different the units are operating in different jurisdictions, the possibility in one jurisdiction of uh, imposing some reinforcing for the for the movements of the resources between the, the, res the, the, the resources in, in one unit to the other unit, and in the case of the multiple point of entry, the reputational effects that could have on the remaining unit when one unit is resolved. Without, without helping them. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. So thank you very much. So in terms of um, bailouts, I mean, the, the moment you have bailouts, obviously, you know, our, our main trade-off is, is no longer there. But the point I think you, you made is that, you know, having MPE might increase the, the public money that you obtain because it limits kind of the bail-ins. That's, that's, I think, is a, is a point that, that could be incorporated 
I think. So, so thank you for that. In terms of um, public interest tests, so in, so in our model there is always uh, a public interest in continuing uh, these units since they generate net present value. So in, in that sense, you know, th there is a public interest in, in continuing them. Uh, but the point is to argue that it might be reasonable, you know, to actually bind your hand that you do not continue unit even if it is in the public interest ex post for ex ante reasons. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, multiple regulators in, in a cross-border setting, so th that is obviously a big point where in those instances you can implement SPOE in the first place or not. And um, I think sometimes you might be able, sometimes not, also depending on you know the countries involved and, and how well they're able to cooperate. The point we want to make is that even if you can do SPOE, so you know if regulators can implement SPOE, there might be reasons not to. Um, and in terms of reputational concerns, I guess one way to read this is that you know announcing that you have an MPOE resolution plan kind of, you know, already communicates that, well, some units might, uh, might be let go, uh, even if, you know, the core business is, is strong. Thank you. So, uh, just in time, uh, we'll finish here and I'll thank the presenters and the discussants for this amazing panel and we'll reconvene here after the coffee for the panel at 11.30. <laughs>